Welcome to worship at Centenary United Methodist. As you know, our Healthy Church team met a couple of weeks ago and determined that it was the safest course of action to suspend in-person worship for a few weeks while the Lynchburg area is experiencing a surge in COVID-19 cases. As we worship together but apart, know that no matter where you are, your church family very much cares about you. Please reach out to the church office if you need support. We are here. We are still family, even when we're not able to be together in person. And now, let us begin our worship with the prelude. For our call to worship today, let's recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we will continue our worship with joy to the world, and if you are at home and watching, you may sing as loudly as you like.
Well, good morning, everybody. I hope all of you had a good Christmas in this crazy and wild year of 2020. I think most people would agree that 2020 has been quite an intimidating year. For the most part, it has been rather disappointing. Now, an optometrist would tell you that 2020 is something you really would be happy to have if you're talking about your eyesight. But reviewing the year 2020 has given us all a horrible case of astigmatism. Things have been wildly skewed, especially in times of discord, I believe. All of us look to something to hang on to for stability, something we can rely on for peace of mind. We all want security, especially when things seem to be straying far from the norm around us. What an adult would rely on for security might be far different than what a child would need. An adult might consider security to be money in the bank, a reliable car with a full tank of gas, or a smart doorbell monitoring the porch. A child might consider a familiar possession to be a source of security. We're all familiar with the term security blanket, which is defined as anything that gives a person a sense of safety or freedom from anxiety. Now that brings me to the point of this little devotion. Perhaps the most famous and literal, I should add, security blanket out there is the one constantly carried by the Peanuts comic strip character, Linus. Surely you're familiar with the baby blue blanket Linus carries with him all the time. As is often the case, sometimes we stumble upon something on the internet that evokes a how about that moment. That happened to me about a month ago. There's hardly anyone who has not seen the wonderful Christmas TV special, A Charlie Brown Christmas. It's still as heartwarming and meaningful now as it was when it first aired way back in 1965. Throughout the story, Charlie Brown is filled with angst as he tries to get through yet another Christmas season. Gaudy light displays, among other things, just don't seem to define the meaning of Christmas for Charlie Brown. Finally, as he and the Peanuts gang are preparing for a Christmas play, in exasperation, he blurts out the question. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And guess who it is that provides the answer? None other than Linus the one who is constantly clinging to his security blanket. But there's more to it than that. As Linus is reciting the King James Version of the Nativity narrative found in Luke chapter 2, he lets go of his blanket at the angel's words, Fear not! Wow! Now that is something to think about. Linus let go of his source of security at those words, Fear not! Can we not do the same? There's a line from the Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, that sums it up nicely. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Looking for security? Jesus is the best security blanket you'll ever find. One that you will never wear out and one that you will never outgrow. Can we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for being with us in this crazy year of 2020, and we look forward to being with you in the year coming up, 2021. Be with us, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in praying together the congregational prayer. Father God, we believe. We believe joyfully in the God of love. With all our being, we celebrate our God. We believe in God who dresses us in the garments of salvation, who by the grace of Christ covers us with the robe of righteousness, adopts us into the holy family, and promises to make us a crown of beauty, a royal diadem in the hand of God. This we believe through Christ Jesus, May the Holy Spirit strengthen our belief. Amen. Father God, we know that you have promised to be with us. Help us to embrace that promise, to trust in that promise, to know that you are never far away. Father God, be with all of those who need your touch today, those who need a healing touch, for illness of body or spirit or mind. Lord, be with them. For those 
who need your comforting touch, those people who are lonely, those people who are sad, those people who feel let down. Lord, bring them strength, bring them comfort, bring them peace. And Lord, for all of us, we ask that you continue to be with us as we work to be your church. Lord, we may not be able to come to the building known as church, but we know that church is what we are, not a place that we go. Lord, help us to make an impact in our community through the actions that we have every day. All of those people that you place in our pathway, help us to see the shape of God in each person that we meet. And Lord, now with the confidence of the children of God, we pray together the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Say a special thank you to Rick Smallshaw for all of his contributions to our worship. And thank you so much for the gifts of David Williams, all of the wonderful ways that he serves our congregation. And of course, very much a large thank you to Pastor Michelle Kim, who leads us which, with such grace and with such passion for God. Thank you for all of the church members, for all of the ways that you continue to contribute to the mission and ministry of Centenary Church. And now let's pray together the congregational prayer of blessing. God of hope and joy, the gifts we offer to you pale when our minds try to grasp 
all we have been given in this season. Wholeness in our woundedness, hope in our despair, peace in our turmoil, forgiveness in our rebellion. Like Simeon, our eyes have seen your salvation, and you give us light in our darkness. Help us embrace your extravagant generosity as we give ourselves to others. In our Savior's holy name we pray. Amen. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. There are 363 shopping days until Christmas which is about 361 more days than I need. The time after Christmas is a difficult one for me, and I know that I'm not alone. On one hand, it is nice to get past the busyness of the season, all the gifts to buy and wrap, <clears throat> making sure that each gift is, right for the, is the right choice for that person. And even in this strange pandemic year, I still had to get a Christmas tree. And eventually, after it settled in the living room for a week, as bare as it was when it was sitting in the field, I eventually managed to put about 600 lights on it. I even love the chaos of preparing part of the Christmas dinner, trying to time it so that everything is cooked and warm when it's time to eat. But after all of this preparation and buildup, it's easy to understand why many people feel a sense of disappointment after Christmas is over. Now, even though there have been years when I was glad to see the last visitor's taillights as they headed up the hill so I could start my Christmas nap, I'm always a little sad when the festivities end. Fortunately, I am glad that I am part Canadian, in my mind mostly, so that I can celebrate Boxing Day on the 26th. Boxing Day originated in the United Kingdom and is celebrated in a number of countries that were previously part of the British Empire, including my beloved Canada, eh? Although it is now mostly a bank holiday and excuse for shopping, it originated as a holiday to give gifts to the poor or those in service positions. The name likely came from the alms box that was placed in Christian churches 
to collect money for the poor. When I first heard the term from my Canadian friends, I thought it was all about the boxes left from all the gifts unwrapped on Christmas Day. And I appreciate any holiday that allows me to stretch the magic of Christmas a little further. The transition from the warmth and wonder and joy of Christmas to the long winter ahead. Well, <clears throat> that can be difficult to navigate. We have had this wondrous time of preparation from before Thanksgiving. Holiday parties, usually. Planning, shopping, making lists, and checking them twice. And now, in the space of a few hours, it's over. What now? What comes after the company we've been anticipating has arrived? We prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Now he's here. What do we do next? It is the beginning of a new year. I'm looking forward to what 2021 will bring because 2020 has been a mess. A new year is a chance for a fresh start, and that's a refreshing thought today. Many people start the new year by making some New Year's resolutions. Usually it is a promise to do better next year than we did last year in some way. About 41% of Americans make resolutions but approximately 80% of them fail by the second week of February. Now, the top 10 resolutions for 2019, according to the Research Institute Statistic Brain, are find a better job, find the love of my life, do more good deeds for others, learn something new, work out more often, <clears throat> spend more time with family and friends, do more exciting things. Quit smoking, make better financial decisions, eat healthier, and lose weight. But it is no wonder that the success rate of those resolutions is so low. Those are some very ambitious goals. Some people don't take New Year's resolutions very seriously. After all, they're just promises that you make to yourself. If you don't follow through, it's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. A promise is a promise, and it is important to keep your promises, even if it's a promise that you make to yourself. We see in today's gospel lesson that God is faithful in keeping his promises. Simeon had lived in prayerful expectancy of the Messiah. Anna was an elderly widow who had committed her life to constant worship, fasting, and prayer in the temple. Each of them lived to see the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. Their two encounters with the infant Jesus, infant we know because Leviticus 12 indicates that this would need to be taking place 40 days after the birth of a male child. Each of these encounters is life-changing for, for Simeon and for Anna, although their reactions are different. It is clear that each of them immediately senses that there is something unique about Jesus, something that connects with their very souls. Simeon gazes upon the Christ child and proclaims that he can now die in peace. Anna breaks into song. Women are far less represented in the Bible than men, especially women with names. Whenever a woman with a name is part of a story, it's important to pay attention. Now, even though the Gospel of Luke has many women characters, as well as many passages that deal with women, in a lot of the examples, Luke presents women in parallel with a story about men. For example, in chapter 1, there is an annunciation to Zechariah, followed by by an annunciation to Mary. In chapter 7, Jesus cures the dying son of the centurion and then raises the deceased son of the widow of Nain. In chapter 18, there is a persistent widow paired with a humble tax collector. Often these women do not speak, and if they do, we're not privy to their actual words. 
Such is the case with Anna. But the scripture is quite clear about her reaction to encountering Jesus. She responds by praising God. But she doesn't just praise God. Luke says that she also speaks about her experience with others, although he does not tell us what she said. He only describes her words as being offered to those who were looking for the redemption of Israel. In this way, Anna is the first evangelist in Luke. She goes out and tells others that the Messiah has been born. Simeon's response is different, but incredibly powerful in its own way. First, he recognizes the fulfillment of God's promise. He had been led to the temple and the Christ child by the Holy Spirit, and he is awed. He speaks directly to God while gazing at God incarnate in his arms. I can die happy now, because you have done what you promised. You sent your salvation for everybody. And Joseph and Mary are stunned. Somehow their cover has been blown. You know they didn't just check in at the temple front desk and say, here we are with the Messiah for his 40-day purification. But Simeon knows. He doesn't have to be told who this is. Simeon blesses the astonished couple and addresses Mary. His next sentences are pure prophecy. The New Revised Standard Version phrases his proclamation in this way. This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now replace this generic concept of the people of Israel with the rock-solid concept of all people. Jesus is going to cause some to fall and some to rise. He will be opposed, and the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, including your thoughts. Hear verses 34 and 35 again, this time from the King James Version. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many may be revealed. Now for some, this is threatening. Imagine that you are part of the religious elite. Your comfortable lifestyle of a temple priest is built upon the structure of temple offerings, sacrifices, payment for access to forgiveness, and ritual purification. We know the rest of the story. We can see the foreshadowing of the next chapter. Jesus is about to turn this old system on its head. And we know that the religious establishment is not going to be happy with this new system. After all, If the people get to be in direct relationship with God, who is going to bring us lambs and calves and pigeons and gold and incense? If the people get to seek forgiveness from God, I'm going to be out of a job. And even more important, if we are all loved by God, then how will I qualify for my super special snowflake bonus blessings? On this 40th day of Jesus' life, Simeon simply indicates that this baby is going to shake up the world. Does he know that this baby will grow up and heal the sick or feed over 5,000 people with a few loaves and fishes? Does Simeon's crystal ball reveal scenes of the future? Jesus calling the fishermen and a tax collector and regular guys to be his closest followers? Jesus, by the well, talking with a woman who Jesus knew was a sinner. Jesus flipping over tables in the temple. Jesus on trial. Simeon may not have had the details, but he knew what was promised. He was a righteous man, 
and would have heard the words of the prophets in the temple all his life. The words from Isaiah were familiar to him, and he was prepared for my whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. He knew the nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. Simeon not only had heard the words of promise, he was prayerfully expectant. He believed this promise would come true. Not that this was necessarily what the world had expected. Nope. Many expected a powerful military leader to swoop in and reclaim lost lands and territories. They thought the Messiah would save Israel by might. Others might have expected some sort of high priest or prophet. A mighty king would have fit the bill. A baby born in a stable was not on anyone's radar. What kind of savior comes in such humility? Crusaders in cradles? Nonsense. But we know the truth is real. God came down to earth to be with us, to be our advocate, our friend, our guide, our example. And it was more radical than any warlord could ever hope to be. Jesus came back to get us back to the original program, to get things back on track, because humans had derailed this God-man relationship train pretty seriously. The Old Testament is one long saga of God's people taking simple rules and complicating things. Garden of Eden, one simple rule. Don't eat from that tree. Give the humans a little time. Fail. Ate from the tree. Got kicked out of paradise. Later, we see the people of Israel freed from captivity in Egypt. One simple rule. Gather only enough manna for that day, except when you get extra for the Sabbath. People of Israel can't listen. They gather too much and it gets worms. That God gives Moses ten pretty simple rules, which he has to do twice, because the first time Moses brings down the tablets to the people and he finds they've decided to worship a calf they made out of gold. What the heck, people of Israel? Ten Commandments. Four are about our relationship to God. No other gods before me, no idols, no misusing my name. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The other six are about our relationship to others. One thing to do. Honor your parents. Five things not to do. Murder, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, and covet other people's stuff. And what do the people of Israel do with that? They look for loopholes and exceptions. So now we've got to define how to act in every possible situation. Many years ago, I was part of the staff of what was then Lynchburg Cablevision, employed at the public access station. Now, although there were just two of us running Cable, cable 6, we were part of the cable company staff and were required to attend monthly meetings, which included such thrilling topics as how many truck rolls the repair crews had done and what equipment was expected to go out for the latest pay-per-view wrestling extravaganza. Usually there were donuts, so I generally sat quietly and behaved myself. One month, we were given notice of a new company policy handed down from Time Warner. It was now against policy for there to be any alcohol on, on uh, company buildings, in company property, or in the vehicles. Now, that's not a big problem for me. I rarely day drink on the job. Seriously, though, this seemed like a quick FYI. 
But the general manager asked if there were any questions. For 20 minutes, the most unusual and unlikely scenarios were tossed out. What if I have beer in my personal car? What if I want to bring someone a bottle of wine for a birthday gift? Or, since the GM drives a company vehicle, does that mean that you can't stop at the ABC store on your way home? On and on. If they had written it all down, it would have taken six pages and had 15 lawyers to review. Look, just don't drink alcohol when you're working and driving our equipment. But that would have been too simple. Act like a grown-up who needs their job was obviously too unclear. Humans. Jesus came on the scene, and things were all tangled up. The law of Moses had grown to include 613 commandments, including 248 things to do, and a whopping 365 things not to do. This had drifted a long way from the original program. Jesus starts his ministry, and Simeon's prophecy is coming true. This sign was being opposed. He heals, and the people in power want to know, well, by whose authority he does such a thing. Then he socializes with commoners and riffraff, tax collectors, harlots, Samaritans. He talks about the destruction of the temple, he tells rich people they've got to give up their stuff. He suggests that a widow's might, given with the right attitude, is worth much more than a pile of gold given with the wrong attitude. And finally, somebody asks him, what part of the law was the most important? Matthew twenty-two thirty-six to 40 says, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he, Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Ten commandments become 613 do's and don'ts, and Jesus takes it back down to two. Love God. Love who and what God loves. Because if you love God, you won't misuse his name. You won't want other idols. You won't even be able to stop with just the Sabbath because your adoration of the one is so complete. And if you love who and what God loves, you'll naturally honor your parents and those who are your earthly foundation. You won't want to murder or steal or commit adultery, and why covet their stuff? If I love you, I want you to have your stuff. And I can't imagine bearing false witness, lying about someone that you love. It just doesn't compute. And if that didn't simplify the God-human relationship enough, after the Last Supper before Jesus offered himself up for us, he gave his disciples one more instruction. In John's gospel, Judas has just left the gathering and he's headed to commit the ultimate betrayal, offering up his teacher and friend to the religious leaders of the day. Jesus addresses the rest of his inner circle. Little children, I am only with you a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. He says, Okay, boneheads, humans, just love each other, and that will make this work. 
And then the promise of salvation was fulfilled. Not in the way that the world would have expected it, some sort of battle victory or a great political coup or even a supernatural show of power like when Moses and crew encountered God at Mount Sinai. No, this was a promise that was fulfilled in the most humble way. Death on a cross between two thieves and still in the midst of that incredible suffering, he still showed the example of generosity and forgiveness. When everyone else would have counted him out, the thief who repented was assured that it was not too late. He would be with Jesus in paradise. With God, it is never too late. He is patiently waiting for us to turn back toward him. You see, he promised he'd never leave us or forsake us. I'm afraid that it is us who do the leaving. Thousands of years and we humans, ah me, we get all cocky and say, okay, God, I got this. You can go worry about something else until we don't got it anymore. And we cry out and say, oh, Where'd you go, God? Why'd you leave? If I were God, I'd smack us on the nose with a rolled up magazine. But God is greater than that. He wipes away our tears and welcomes us back into his presence. What about us? How are we doing at keeping our promises? When you were confirmed or when you joined the church, you had the opportunity to make some promises. You had the chance to say, yes, I'm deciding that this is for me. I'm choosing to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And then hopefully you spend the rest of your life figuring out what that looks like. That decision is not a conclusion. It isn't the end of something. It's the beginning of a journey or a journey with new purpose. On this dawn of a new year, this is a chance for us to renew our promise. Are we ready to say, maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time, for me, maybe for the thousandth time? Yes, I'm deciding that this is for me. I'm choosing to be a follower of Jesus. And I'm going to do that by showing love to everyone that I encounter. I accept the challenge of loving those who act unlovable and who I disagree with and who are different from me. With your help, Lord, help me to grow closer to you. And the kingdom of God will come upon the earth. Amen.
servants of God, depart now in peace. Prophets, go in power. For we have seen salvation prepared by the merciful hand of God. With Mary and Joseph, ponder these things. With Anna and Simeon, praise the Lord. Let us grow and be strong, that we may find wisdom. May God's hand and ours hold the hands of earth's children. Amen. Amen.